My name is Andrea Bells. I serve as Division Director of Industrial Innovation and Partnerships at the National Science Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our Wireside chat. This is a chance for us to engage in a dialogue with experts from the academic world and the technology commercialization world to learn a little bit more about some of the current research and findings around technology commercialization. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Timothy Folta of the University of Connecticut. Tim Folta has a PhD from Purdue University and serves as professor, the Thomas John and Betty Wolf Family Chair of Strategic Entrepreneurship at the University of Connecticut. He's faculty director of the Connecticut Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the this year's chair of the Strategic Management Division of the Academy of Management, and visiting professor at El Instituto de Empresa. Uh, here our speaker. Before he was at UConn, he held the Brock Family Chair of Strategic Management at Purdue University. It's such a pleasure to welcome Tim. He's going to talk about a paper that he has that was recently published in the Academy of Management Discoveries. And then after that, we'll have time for questions to be submitted through the chat so that we can engage in a dialogue with Professor Folta. But it really is a pleasure to have you here and thank you for joining us. Uh, the pleasure is mine. I'm super excited uh, to be here with you. Um, this is uh, the first of several projects uh, related to entrepreneurial policy uh, with Superdeep Dutta and Jenna Rodriguez, um, who's a PhD student uh, at UConn. Superdeep is the University of Buffalo. Uh, and this project is perhaps most closely related to this agency uh, because it focuses on whether NSF prioritizes the right ventures to fund in the SBIR program. Uh, and before we get started, I'd just like to um, just uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to have a, an engagement like this. Uh, as chair of the, the division that I, that I lead, uh, we've been trying to build community uh, for the past year and, and it's through efforts like this uh, that I think really make a difference. So. Uh, uh, thanks for connecting today with me. So um, what do we mean? What do we mean by the right ventures? Uh, I said we're going to test to see whether NSF funds the right ventures. What do we mean? I pulled this directly from the NSF webpage because it clarifies the emphasis on high risk, high impact technologies and ventures. So uh, essentially we examine whether NSF prioritizes higher impact and higher risk technologies and ventures. I'll also share a little bit of evidence about objectives around diversity, uh, but that effort is secondary to assessing riskiness and impact. So while our empirical effort is specific to NSF's SBIR program, the broader question we investigate pertains to whether governments should be in the business of being their region's entrepreneurial seed fund. I'm fully aware that I'm speaking to the choir on this issue, but, but research suggests the answer is far from obvious. There is a large contingent of work suggesting that government should not be in the business of venture capital for several reasons. First, uh, capital market players are more capable and efficient at resolving information asymmetry because they have lots of experience, networks, and they tend to specialize in certain industries uh, so they can um, discern whether an opportunity is uh, truly good or not. They also have stronger incentives to invest to maximize returns. A second reason to doubt whether government should be in this business is that government players may have objectives other than value creation, which confound attempts to optimize. Uh, uh, for example, selection committees may be enamored with technology but less capable at discerning commercial potential or diagnosing business models. 
or ascertaining whether entrepreneurial teams have the right character or makeup. Well, while government agencies have institutionalized effective processes for determining technical merit, assessing the combination of technical and commercial potential is really quite complex. Alternatively, uh, agencies may award grants in alignment with policy objectives rather than on the basis of technical or, or commercial merit. Processes may not be insulated from political influence to fund certain types of projects over others or projects in certain regions. Some venture applicants have been identified as SBIR mills because of their ability to continually attract funds uh, through, this, through the SBIR grant process. And, and this capability may actually supersede the quality of the underlying commercial potential. Finally, uh, behavioral researchers are suggesting that uh, there's all sorts of biases and processes and, and there's probably reasons to believe that government processes aren't any different than in any other organization. So th there's another camp, uh, presumably the one to which this agency belongs and many of the listeners here, uh, highlighting that government might play an important role in funding ventures. It's pretty clear that private investors will underinvest in risky projects, for example, the type of which might have the most positive externalities uh, for society. And one school of thoughts thought believes that government should fill this void. Some argue that government should seek to build a country's comparative advantage and do so by funding ventures consistent with these ideals, these goals. For these and other reasons, uh, public investment in entrepreneurs might be an important complement to private sector investment, or it may signal status to the applicant. So there are two camps that speak to whether the governments should invest in startups. One camp, one camp clearly suggests the government has a role. The other camp clearly suggests the government will not do a good job in that role. So I suppose it's safe to say that we're invest investigating the latter issue. Can the government do a good job funding the right ventures? We're agnostic about what, what the answer is here. And, and we, we, we took, this, took this perspective on purpose. We didn't want passion uh, about a particular hypothesis to bias our results even if passion is a good thing in personal relationships, it's quite dangerous in the area of research. So, um, so we're not the first to investigate the effectiveness of the SBIR program. A host of research, in fact, has shown that firms receiving funding outperform other similar firms. The problem with this research is that it fails to reconcile whether the better performance is due to a treatment effect or whether the program merely selects the better firms. So only two studies I know of uh, have looked at whether there's a treatment effect, whether the grant actually makes a difference or not. Uh, and um, these two studies show um, mixed results. One study shows, and shows no effect, the other study shows, shows a, 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 a reasonable treatment effect. So, so in contrast to the overwhelming total effect found by, uh, found by the first group of scholars, uh, there is not robust evidence of a treatment effect. This seems to suggest that selection effects are driving the positive total effect. But we don't know anybody that's tested whether the government does a good job selecting the best ventures. And so this is, this is what we do. 
So we focus on selection. Does the, uh, does the NSF SBIR program prioritize the ventures with greater commercial potential, with greater technical potential, and uh, with uh, greater technical and commercial risk? And you might say, well, why the latter? And the answer is, well, it's, it's because it's the risky projects that really make a difference in society. And, uh, and, you know, one school of thought is that that's what the, that's what the government should be in the business of doing, if, if at all. So, um, you know, in academics, we like to highlight, well, what are, what are we doing that's different uh, than what other people have done? And uh, our difference is that we're focusing on selection effects in the SBIR program. Note that we're not examining treatment effects. Um, we're focusing on selection. You know, we're, our, our, our specific empirical analysis is in the context of NSF and the SBIR program specifically, uh, but we think it has implications for government agencies around the world seeking to spur entrepreneurship. And we know that nearly every government in the world is trying to do that right now. Can they do so effectively? Uh, and uh, I guess the third contribution is that it, it's actually really kind of difficult to do this. It's really difficult to tease apart selection from treatment. And um, the way we do it is um, we follow, we, there was a paper done by Park, and um, he uses uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act as a natural experiment. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. But, but this, this natural experiment allows us to test this specific issue. OK, so, um, so the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. So this occurred. Uh, the Obama administration instituted it. Uh, $831 billion was infused into the economy various government agencies, 3 billion of which went to the NSF, 50 million went to the NSF SBIR program. And uh, what, why is this of value to us is because it, it uh, because NSF gets the, got the extra money, they were able to um, distribute that money uh, and uh, they were able to distribute it the money that the money to people that have already applied for the grant, and and this is important because uh, otherwise it's impossible to distinguish what the priorities are because the government only releases uh, the firms that receive the funding. Uh, but now that uh, now that we have access to firms that uh, receive the funding in a second wave. Uh, presumably, uh, the second wave of firms, what we call the era-funded firms, uh, received a lower priority in the in the selection process than the higher uh, than the regular-funded firms. So it's it's this the fact that uh, we can now discern based on based on this era event which which ventures the government prioritized, we can, we can then test whether the regular funded firms are actually different from the era funded firms, the second, the second wave. Um, and uh, this enables the test. We would expect if the government prioritizes the right way, we would expect the regular funded firms to outperform the era funded firms. Now, if we had access to all the firms that uh, did not receive uh, the funding, that applied and did not receive, you know, we wouldn't necessarily need this, but, but the government doesn't release that data. So, so we have to use this natural experiment to drive at this issue. Okay, so um, a, a little bit about the sample and I'll share some results with you. Okay, so we follow one grant, uh, proposal solicitation by NSF 2008-548. And this particular um, solicitation targeted biotech and chemical 
electronics components and engineering systems. Um, and uh, from that process, we could identify 620 firms that were funded through the regular program, and then another um, 143 firms that were funded through ERA. Okay. Uh, we were able to track down additional data for all these firms through the data sources li listed above, including patent data, um, whether they got venture capital, um, uh, even revenues and so forth. Some um, filtering of the data was done, it's described down below, but essentially we ended up with 143 ERA funded firms, 514 regular budgeted, uh, regular funded firms. Um, a little bit about the process, just so you know. Uh, down below is the regular budget timeline. Applications were due on June 10th, uh, 2008. Um, and um, and then you can see they were dispersed. Uh, there were two, two application deadlines with this solicitation, and then they were dispersed um, you know, up until 2010. You can see the era timeline, the, the money came in in the middle of 2009, and, uh, uh, and they were dispersed thereafter. It gives you a sense for what we're looking at here. So, so empirically, the, the way we're going to drive at this is we're going to look for evidence as to whether the regular funded firms outperform the era funded firms. Remember, the regular funded firms received priority from the NSF. And was this priority justified or not? That's what we're going to look at. Uh, we're also going to examine whether there might be selection preferences for cutting edge, high risk ventures. This, as you saw in, in the second slide, this is a key priority of the NSF. And many people think this is where government should play if they're gonna play at all. Um, uh, and then, uh, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna attempt to isolate what observable firm attributes might explain uh, their selection capability. We'll, we'll, look, we'll look at that. And uh, the final thing we do, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to present this last bullet point, but, uh, um, uh, you know, so I'll just skip it right now. Okay, so here's a little bit of data. I want to give you a sense for what the, um, the dependent variables are for quality and riskiness. And we tried to get a mixture of technical and commercial quality. And you know, we think the patent variables drive at that. And we think the venture capital and IPO acquisition variables drive at the commercial capability uh, a bit. Um, uh, so we, we measure patent counts, uh, patent citations, firms with more highly, with more patents and more highly cited patents uh, in the, you know, are, are deemed to have more valuable technology. Firms that receive venture capital uh, are deemed to be of higher quality because venture investors are willing to contribute to that firm. Firms that are sought out uh, to acquire, so as a target company, uh, are often thought as more valuable as firms that are not sought out. And certainly firms that, that go through IPO uh, are, are deemed uh, more valuable. So these are you know, these are uh, relatively typical output measures uh, in strategy and entrepreneurship, driving at technical and commercial capability. Now, in terms of riskiness, uh, this is a bit more difficult. What we do here is we, we're we looking to see, we, we take citations. Uh, this is one of our, our measures. And, and if a firm, if a firm's patents fall in uh, you know, the highest distribution, the if, if, they're, if they're in the upper 10th percentile of um, other firms with similar patents in terms of citations, they are deemed to have um, uh, much, much more valuable patents. Similarly, if a firm has, has, is in the, in the lower 10th percentile in terms of citation count, uh, that's deemed to be um, uh, relatively uh, unattractive in terms of um, in terms of um, its uh, its output. So, so firms that have patents in the upper and the lower are deemed to be uh, 
seeking riskier outcomes. Okay, so that's how we look at it. And then patent originality is another uh, variable that basically uh, looks to see uh, whether the the patent, the firm's patents, cite uh, a more diverse set of other patents. When you submit patents, you have to cite uh, other prior knowledge. And uh, to the extent that they have a more diverse patent uh, citation, list of patents that are cited, that suggests it's more complex. And so, uh, so that's, that's usually thought to be more risky. So in the right-hand side here, you see the right-hand side columns, you can get a sense for what the, um, what the uh, means are for these variables. And they pretty much support uh, the story that the government is prioritizing the right ventures. So for example, through the regular process, um, uh, the number of patents is 0.27, through the error process, it's 0.16. And those stars suggest significance. There's a significant difference between them. Similarly with citations, regular funded firms have more citations than error funded firms. Regular funded firms get more venture capital than error funded firms. Regular funded firms are more likely to, to go to achieve an IPO or be acquired than error funded firms. You also see that regular funded firms are more likely to, to have highly cited patents. They're also more likely to have lower cited patents. Okay. Uh, so that suggests these simple descriptives suggest that, that uh, the government is prioritizing the right firms. And the patent originality score is consistent with that as well. Okay, and these are just control variables that we use. Okay, so um, the regression model, uh, we try to go beyond those descriptives and uh, run a multivariate regression model uh, to, to provide a more rigorous test of these findings. And uh, the focus on this regression model is gonna be the error coefficient. There's gonna be a dummy variable for if the venture was funded through error or if it was funded through the regular process. So the focus here is gonna be on the error variable. And uh, I'm, I'm showing you, this is a, a table that we often put in our papers, but, but the interpretation is the following here. So, um, uh, so just be, before I go into this, uh, note that I, I just want I want you to look at the variables in the model here. Uh, note that the additional controls potentially related to, to selection are not used in the estimation so as not to confound the identification of selection effects. So to capture the effect of selection in its entirety, including observable and unobservable factors, the analysis is focused on this error variable and does not include other firm level controls. In subsequent models that I'll show you, um, uh, we add variables to isolate which specific observable determinants influence selection. So this, uh, this set of results suggests that error funded firms are um, produce 19% fewer patents and have 12.9% fewer patent citations. Okay, again, that's kind of consistent with the descriptives that I just showed you. The regular fund, the prioritized firms, the regular funded firms are um, uh, performing better. Okay, uh, another, these two variables correspond to commercialization potential, uh, and essentially we get uh, similar results. So the duration to receive subsequent VC money is increased by 36% for era funded firms, and the duration to, to, to achieve IPO, the, the time until an IPO, is increased by 71%. So era funded firms are slower to go IPO, is slower to get acquired and slower to get VC money. Just wanna highlight that I'm not presenting these results here, but we also replicated these, re these results 
with um, other output measures such as revenues and phase two SBIR awards. So they seem robust to a number of different measures. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, this, these, this table pertains to risk and riskiness. Okay, remember the, it, we see the high citation patent, whether a firm has, is more likely to have a high citation patent. We see the arrow firms are less likely to have a high citation patent. Those stars next to it suggest it's significant and they're less likely to have a low citation patent. And you may argue that's, that's, that's good that era, it's good for era firms that they're, they have their, but, but we're driving at riskiness here. What we're showing here is that there's a greater distribution for regular funded firms uh, than era funded firms. And you can see the economic effects there, okay? Um, okay, so uh, you may be curious, uh, well, what is NSF looking at when they make these decisions? What's driving their selection capability? And this table, this table begins to get at that particular issue. Um, in particular, you can see these asterisks next to the coefficients for patents, prior patents and prior grants. So not surprisingly, the selection committees look at these variables when they're trying to decide, um, uh, and those seem important. Um, uh, I wanna highlight that the error coefficient is still significant, okay? And, and that's important for the following reason. It suggests that we're not, we're not fully accounting for selection capability. There's still some unobservable capability that, ERA ha that, that NSF has that this, this model is not picking up. So, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Andrea, how am I doing on time? Great. I think uh, you should please feel free to continue maybe for another five-ish minutes, okay. and then we can perhaps collect some questions. Okay. So, so what's driving NSF's unobservable selection capability? The, the, the capability we're not fully capturing in the models that I just showed you. Another way to interpret this is what is NF, NSF doing right that perhaps may constitute best practice for other agencies or governments to follow? Uh, we don't have a conclusive answer here, but our, our data, the data that I showed you certainly doesn't tell us, but we have conducted some interviews with NSF program directors and we try to and we tried to drive at this, uh, this question through those interviews. So first, uh, one of the things we learned is they have a strong focus on commercialization. This contrasts with NIH, for example. Um, NSF implements this by hiring program directors with entrepreneurial experience or venture investing experience. And we think this is quite important because at NSF, SBIR program directors have quite a bit of latitude in deciding which ventures to fund. They don't purely rely on the rankings of the committee, but use it to complement their own judgment. Second, the due diligence process is iterative, where program managers reach out to applicants with questions and advice. Um, so learning takes place on both sides. Third, uh, the review committee has both technical and commercial experience. And this combination is potent because it illuminates uh, key issues that a purely technical committee might miss. Finally, there's some latitude in awarding ventures that might score low in certain categories, but very high in others. For example, prior entrepreneurial success might weigh heavily in some instances. So these four attributes strike us as, a, as best practices worth highlighting to other governments seeking to develop a selection capability. Okay, a, a, a few minutes on conclusions. Um, so we find that NSF's SBIR program prioritize, prioritizes ventures with stronger technical and commercial potential and higher riskiness. Some of you uh, may not be surprised by these findings. After all, this is what they aim to accomplish. However, I want to remind you that 
a whole host of research recommends against government involvement based on the premise that government agencies cannot do this competently, even if they have a desire to create social and economic value. So this study also speaks more generally to whether governments around the world can effectively spur entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, and before, before diving into this, these broader implications, let me just speak a little bit about the limitations. And I think I'll do this quickly given my time constraints. Um, you know, we could explore additional output measures such as employment and survival. Um, we did use quite a few uh, output measures or performance measures and, and we're pleased with those, but I suppose we could, we could do more. Uh, we're probably uh, under-reporting uh, benefits, uh, certainly indirect benefits or positive externalities not captured by these measures. So for, for example, if there's society benefits that, that extend beyond the, the commercial payoffs, we're not capturing that. Our, our focus on patent citations captures some of this, but uh, certainly not all. Um, subsequent work should definitely investigate and compare the selection ability of the 10 other agencies uh, beyond NSF that host S SBIR, SBIR programs. Uh, we are constrained by ERA. Uh, NSF and NIH were the only agencies to get ERA money in this, re in this regard. And so we could only institute this natural experiment at NSF and NIH. If you're interested, I could talk about the NIH findings. Um, uh, but we believe that a singular focus on NSF uh, helps us to control for any cross-agency differences. So uh, even if we could have included them, uh, I'm not sure uh, it would have been beneficial to the study. Uh, certainly, processes have changed since 2009, uh, subsequent to that shock and the analysis uh, that we have here. Indeed, our interviews with program directors suggest even more emphasis now on commercial potential and targeting ventures not having previously received SBIR funding. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop with the, uh, that. I wanna show you this, this is kind of curious. This is, we did look, one of the objectives is to fund uh, minority and women owned businesses. Uh, and we did a test and basically found that the results seem to hold in the case of minority. In other words, the agency NSF prioritizes minority owned businesses, uh, but there was no significant effect for female owned uh, businesses. So um, that's just something that we didn't highlight in the paper, but I, I thought it was sufficiently interesting to pass on. Okay, uh, Jenna and Superdeep and I are doing some additional work. Uh, at this time, we're gonna look at NIH because we've got some exciting data on how selection committees are made up. And we're gonna examine uh, whether the makeup of these selection committees actually has an impact on some of the outcomes that we've talked about today. Um, another thing we're looking at, which I think is kind of interesting is the, the COVID crisis changed work for all of us. Uh, and it particularly changed work uh, for the SBIR selection process. So all the, all the committees went online. They kept giving money, but they all went online. And does, does moving virtual affect the quality of the outcomes? So we're, uh, we're going to test that. There's all sorts of reasons to think that it might. Um, so finally, um, let me just wrap by saying, well, I'm, I'm certainly pleased to be here, but, but our work contrasts with a body of work suggesting that markets should be the exclusive source of funding ventures uh, because markets, um, because governments are, are, are less efficient at allocating capital to entrepreneurs. Even among scholars on the side of government venture investing, uh, our study enlightens in several ways. First, uh, our finding that governments uh, can effectively invest directly in technology ventures differentiates us 
from those advocating governments to invest in prop promising science while leaving the task of building economic value to others. Uh, while some argue that governments should play a complementary role with markets in maintaining a country's comparative advantage, our findings suggest that by investing in risky technologies and opportunities, they might develop new comparative advantages by pushing the boundaries of current advantages. It's obvious uh, that many regional governments are asked to experiment to harness a region's high growth potential. And we confirm they can generate capabilities to do so. Uh, and finally, while some emphasize that governments are custodians of their region's long-term interests and should not cede these interests to private investors overly focused on short-term gains, we empirically demonstrate that governments are capable at identifying and funding ventures with the most promising long-term outcome. So thank you very much. I look forward to the question and answer period. Tim, thank you so much for that interesting study. And maybe a couple of things that um, I can highlight right now that dovetail with what you were saying. First of all, we most definitely are looking for uh, program officers who understand the private markets, as you've indicated here. And so I do want to highlight to our attendees that we do have openings right now in the SBIR and STTR program. And so if you're interested in being part of that team, we're happy to talk with you. Um, we also want to highlight that you pointed out in the first one of your early slides, the Josh Lerner finding, which said something along the lines of government is really not able to resolve the information asymmetries. And, and Josh spoke at our uh, Wireside chat a couple of months ago. We talked about this a little bit. So it was interesting. It, it's interesting to hear how your work contrasts with that finding and that the information asymmetry problem looks a little bit differently here. Um, I We do have a couple of questions that are coming. And so maybe- I'm sorry, I'm, before you say something, oh, can I just add that- Please. Uh, uh, now my findings seem to support NSF and uh, I, I, I was actually surprised uh, to learn that Andrea didn't, Andrea didn't know about my findings when she asked me to talk. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, she must have heard about my study and wants, wants me to broadcast the results. And, and uh, she later informed me that, no, she didn't know anything about it. So, uh, so kudos to you for, uh, for not planting the seed, so to speak. Thank, thank you for saying that. It is also true that you are, your work is well known in the community. And so I was interested in, in other studies that you had done. But this one, of course, is really front and center, the kinds of topics that we care about deeply. Well, so, and, and thank you for saying that. And I have to say that this is the first uh, work in this realm for me, in this policy realm. And I'm super excited to be here and um, uh, look forward to more work in the area. So. In general, Tim, I'd really like to thank you for this. As I noted earlier, I was interested in other work of yours, but of course, this really is central to our mission as an agency and our mission as a division and a program. So thank you for walking us through it and walking us through your econometrics. We have a diverse set of experiences here on the line and you've really made this material so clear and so accessible to us. So I hope everyone will join me in thanking Professor Folta for his time. It's been really interesting and I want to thank you again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone for your interest.